Welcome to uh, Longleaf tonight. We're going to call the meeting to order. We did not meet an executive session tonight, but uh, we're starting right off in public session uh, for the August 13th meeting. At this time, I'm going to ask Ms. Brill to deliver our uh, moment of silence and inspirational moment and with the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you please stand? Um, before we have a moment of silence, I wanted to remember the families who have lost loved ones recently. Um, our dearly beloved Lottie, Lottie Chisholm, her husband passed away recently, Dr. Andrew Chisholm. And um, also, um, certainly Dr. Bill Fleming lost his brother, and Mrs. Spector lost her mother recently. And also the family of Gabby Swanson, she was a Ridgeview cheerleader. And uh, my understanding is their memorial service will be held for her on Sunday, and a candlelight vigil will be held on Wednesday in Elgin. Um, so remember these folks in your prayers, and Chip's Uncle Joe. And Chip's Uncle Joe, that's right. Thank you, Melinda. Um, I understand that um, Chip was um, played a huge part in his life, and I want to remember everyone who's had a sadness and. If you would bow your head and um, for a moment of silence. Okay, this time um, item three is the approval of, um, of the current agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Jackson, any second? Second. Second, Mr. Manning. Ready for the vote? very much. You now have to vote. The next item, number four, is our consent agenda, which includes approval of our agenda, approval of the minutes from the previous meeting, a budget update, um, a student readmission request, and ratification of personnel. Is there any discussion on these items or questions? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve. Uh, motion to approve. Second it. Second. Any discussion? Further discussion? Mr. Chair, the, the page you handed out, was that an amendment or part of the actual? It was actually part of the, it was in the. Uh, okay, the okay. Thank you. Oh, no, I thought it was no, it's, separate. It's, no, it's in the, it's in the uh, electronic. Oh, well, I withdraw my motion. Okay, do we have a motion to approve? So, so approve, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay, you have a motion. A second. A second. Okay. All, okay, all those of the vote, ready to vote on the um, consent agenda? Go ahead and vote. Actually, Mr. Um, Mr. Jackson actually made the motion, but we'll you can correct that later, okay? Okay. Withdrawal. Okay, passed uh, six to one vote uh, for the con uh, consent agenda. Is that right? Are we voting on Melinda's motion or um, Chips? Which one are we voting on? Voted on 
on chips. I, I withdrew my motion. Mm -hmm. She got uh, uh, Calvin Jackson. But Susan I think Brew. she's trying to get an understanding of right. what she was voting on. Consent agenda. What am I voting on? Melinda's motion or chips? Then I need to change my vote. The motion was the same. She just re re she just said she wasn't. Yeah, I didn't know all that was included. I thought that was separate. Yeah, that's when I when I handed it out. I said this was included. Okay, thank you. Okay, for uh, yeah. two. Okay, this time I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hanger for an announcement, please. Yes, it's Becky. with great pleasure that I announce our new chief financial officer, Dr. Harry Miley. If you would stand up. You may recognize his name. He's known statewide as an expert on financial issues and has his own firm, owner of Miley & Associates, where he has done extensive work assisting government as well as educational organizations. He served as the chairman of the Board of Economic Advisors for eight years under two governors. He was the senior economist for the board, uh, the Budget and Control Board for five years, and we are fortunate to have him now as a member of our Richland 2 team. Welcome, Dr. Miley. Dr. Dr. Miley, would you like to say a word? All I can say is thank you. I'm looking forward to working with a, a great district and uh, have with a great board and staff. I have some heavy, big shoes to fill, I know. If I may, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Miley is a friend and a colleague, and we have worked together over the years on a number of statewide projects. And uh, I'll just say, Harry, welcome aboard. Item five tonight is special recognitions. Um, Dr. Ham, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm, well, who's in charge? And actually, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Blackstone. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board, Dr. Ham, and, and staff. Tonight, we'd like to present the flags and certificates to 18 Richland II schools and centers that earned 23 Palmetto Gold and Silver Awards for general performance and closing the achievement gap for the 2012-2013 school year. Four of them, Bethel Hanbury, Bridge Creek, uh, Lake Carolina, uh, elementary schools, Blythewood Middle School, um, all received both the Palmetto Gold Awards in uh, both categories, I should say. So I'm gonna call up the representatives from each school to come uh, in uh, alphabetical order. So if uh, once I uh, call your name and and if you know that uh, you're going to be coming up next, then why don't you just kind of get in line and, and, uh, and uh, come up and we have the flags and the certificates from the State Department of Education to um, present to you. So with that, I'm going to um, ask Jeff Williams from Bethel Hanbury Elementary School, again, who received the gold in both categories, to, uh, to come forward and um, receive your flag and certificates and take a quick picture. <laughs> Blythewood High School received gold in the general performance category and is represented by Principal Keith Price, I believe. Blythewood Middle School received gold in both categories. And Dr. Brenda Hafner, would you please come forward? And guess. And guess. <laughs> We're still in the Bs. Uh, Bookman Road Elementary School received gold in the general performance category. 
and is represented by Principal Kendra James. And to round out the Bs, we have Bridge Creek Elementary, who received gold in both categories and is represented by Principal Kristen Eubanks. Banks and team as well. The Center for Knowledge received gold in the general performance category and is represented by Principal Dr. Jolaine Hall. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking this time before I say it. Okay, Forest Lake Elementary School receives silver in the Closing the Achievement Gap category and is represented by Principal Dr. Kathy Steck and Dr. Bozier. <laughs> Killian Elementary School receives silver in the Closing the Achievement Gap category and here to receive his flag is Dr. Robert Scotland. Lake Carolina Elementary School. I'm oh. so sorry. I accidentally grabbed several that we didn't want. <laughs> we will make sure everybody leaves with the right uh, flag. Lake Carolina Elementary received gold in both categories and is represented by, doc by Dr. Andrea Berry, principal, and her team. Langford Elementary receives silver in the general performance category and is represented by Principal Casina Jackson. <laughs> Nelson Elementary School receives silver in the general performance category and here to receive her flag is Karen Beeman, Principal. Polo Road Elementary School receives silver in the general performance category and is represented by Principal Dr. Marshallin Franklin. <laughs> Pontiac Elementary receives silver in the closing the achievement gap category and is represented by both current principal Katie Barber and former principal Beth Elliott. Principal Jennifer Gillespie. Uh, Rice Creek Elementary received gold in the Closing the Achievement Gap category and is represented by Principal Sean Biston and team.
Round Top Elementary received gold in the general performance category. And here to accept the award is Principal Janine Tucker. Sand Lapper Elementary received silver in the general performance category and gold in the closing achievement gap category. And Principal Linda Hall is here. <laughs> Spring Valley High received gold in the general performance category. And here to accept his flag is Dr. Baron Davis. And the Center for Inquiry is uh, last but not least, and they receive the gold in the general performance category, and uh, they are represented here tonight by, I know Dr. Lynn Mueller said she wasn't going to be able to make it. I'm not sure if I think their whole staff is on a retreat to get ready for the new school year. Well, we'll make sure that we get them their flag and uh, certificate. So let's have another round of applause for all of our <laughs> We do have one more uh, recognition today, and that is for Forest Lake Elementary School. Their technology magnet uh, school was being for being featured in a recent issue of the USA Today magazine. You see uh, and, um, the cover of it, uh, and now there, well, there's a the cover. Okay, we'll go back <laughs> back to the. This is the inside article um, that uh, the, the, that spotlighted the school's use of technology in the classroom, and I know that that might be a little bit. Um, uh, difficult uh, to, to see, but uh, and I'm not sure whether it's even been published yet, but um, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find this uh, online, but it's a, it's a really neat picture and some graphics about what the uh, modern classroom looks like, and it takes me back to images of the uh, classroom of the future back at uh, Killian Elementary School. Um, uh, well, that was back in 98 or something like that, so we've come a long way, and I'd like for Principal Dr. Cappy Steck to come up to be recognized for being featured in wow. that publication. Okay, well, that is our recognitions for tonight. And now, Mr. Chairman, at this time, I would like to turn it over to uh, Sue Millett for our uh, student learning focus. Thank you, Ken. Our teachers worked really hard this summer, and you're going to hear some of the opportunities that they had a little bit later. But our uh, teachers did some unusual kinds of things as well. And so we're delighted to have Dr. Charles Vaughn, social studies his, uh, teacher from Richland Northeast, who's <coughs> going to come forward and share his experience in Amsterdam, uh, ne the, ne the Netherlands. And he has. Um, Brought back many, many opportunities and strategies for our teachers. Uh, so we're delighted this was a partnership among several different organizations. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Board of Trustees, um, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to be able to tell you a little bit about what I did this summer uh, related to professional development. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ham, Ms. Millett, and Ms. Gregory for inviting me to make this brief presentation. Uh, for geographers, it's all about place, so I have a map there. Um, and as I suspect that you may have experienced at some point in your life, historians are not known for their brevity, so I'm going to try to make this quick. <laughs> Although over dinner the other night, it stretched out for a long time. So during, during my month I spent in, in Europe, I visited several different places um, in the United Kingdom. I visited the Mary Rose Museum. Uh, which houses artifacts from the uh, Mary Rose, which was a flagship of uh, Henry VIII. Uh, visited the Bayou Tapestry, uh, Mont Saint-Michel, uh, the D-Day beaches, uh, particularly the Omaha Cemetery, Omaha Beach Cemetery, and a neighborhood in Berlin that was divided by uh, the Berlin Wall and was really impacted 
by um, that division um, and was on the front line of the Cold War, as well as various museums related to the Holocaust in World War II in Amsterdam and in Berlin. So all of these experiences I'll be able to bring back to my students um, and use in my curriculum in my human geography classes with ninth graders as well as my modern world history classes. The impetus of this trip uh, in professional development was an invitation for a two-week residency at the Anne Frank Foundation um, in the International Department at the Anne Frank House. Um, received that back in August, I mean in April, um, for some work we did uh, in the spring with a partnership that I'll describe in just a minute. So there I am in front of being a tourist. Um, I work with personnel in the curriculum, international um, departments, education, and group, um, group visits. I reviewed curriculum material that um, is being used in Australia currently, was given free access to their electronic uh, archives, so I was able to pull resources together from, um, from them that I'll be able to share, I mean, not only use in my classroom, but share with teachers who participated in some workshops we did back in May. Um, that was a, one of the views from the office down there on the lower right. Um, not exactly a view that I have from my classroom every day, but uh, that made it easy to get up and go to work in the morning. Um, I could not help but feel the importance of the work that we were doing. Um, from my office, um, I could see the rear of the secret annex, so you can see that. Um, in the left-hand side, the red tile roof is where Anne Frank and her family uh, spent 789 days in hiding um, with four other, other individuals. Um, on the right, uh, you know, she was everywhere in the landscape. On the right was, is a small statue of her um, outside the Vesterkirk, which is right beside the Anne Frank house. And then in the lower um, portion in the right-hand side, uh, when the Franks first moved to Amsterdam, they lived in uh, a suburb um, of Mervita Plain, which is south of the city. So that's a statue of Anne looking back over her shoulder. Um, probably very typical. I mean, that may have been the way she looked when they left their house in, on June 6, uh, 1942, to go into hiding, never to return to that area. I later spent time um, in um, Frankfurt on Main, where I met with Dr. Marin Mendel, director of the Anne Frank Youth Center. And in Berlin, I met with uh, Patrick Siegel, who's a project manager um, of the Anne Frank Center there. Both sites gave me additional insights into how we can best utilize this traveling exhibition uh, with teachers and with students. Uh, my professional development evolved through a series of coincidences, connections, and relationships I've forged over the years. Uh, back in January, um, Dr. Doyle Stev Stevick at the University of South Carolina uh, in the College of Education contacted me. He had served on my dissertation committee and knew uh, that I had deep connections within uh, not only the social studies community in the state but also on a national level. And so he wanted to put together some teacher workshops um, and also bring this traveling exhibition and Frank uh, a history for today. Um, so back in, we worked and worked um, on this and planned two workshops for teachers that occurred the first weekend in May, and we also trained 24 students um, from TLC, AVID, and the Single Gender Program um, at Dent to serve as peer guide facilitators. And so that's a picture of them now. Um, they will be able to, to guide students through this um, 34 panel exhibition to learn about Anne Frank and then be able to use that to talk about current uh, day issues. Um, so um, on May 3rd and 4th, we conducted workshops for approximately 30 teachers representing areas, uh, various areas of the state. Um, the three scholars from the Anne Frank House worked with teachers um, and the workshops were designed not only to uh, enrich instruction about Anne Frank and the Holocaust, but also were applicable to other subject areas as well. Um, workshop participants, you can see here, are analyzing primary source documents, um, and they conducted dialogues about current human rights abuses and discussed ways to integrate the content across the curriculum. One of the participants, um, Barbara Harefield, seen in the middle of the picture, she's a social studies coordinator in, in Charleston County, and she noted that the social studies classroom is the intersection of point of many different academic skills. Not only do we teach what happened, we guide students through analyzing documents and help them develop the skill of reading nonfiction text. All of this is extremely crucial 
in the Common Core. Uh, the life story of Anne Frank is the centerpiece of this exhibition. The family story uh, reflects world events prior to, during, and after the period of Nazi dictatorship. The exhibit juxtaposes photographs of the Frank family with images of historical events at the time to show how persecuted people such as the Franks were affected by political decisions and the actions of individuals. It is also uh, a springboard for discussing modern day human rights abuses. Uh, I'd like to conclude by um, sharing with you information about the traveling exhibition. Mark Turner, who is a site coordinator at Dent, um, and I spent Monday morning uh, installing the exhibition, and um, today, uh, Rob Levin, back there from the Anne Frank Center in New York, was here to work uh, additionally with our students, and we had an afternoon session with some teachers from um, Dent, um, Killian Elementary, and um, Blythewood High School to discuss logistics for um, involving the greater community, not just the, the students at Dent. Um, so our plan is during the school day, uh, teachers will be able to sign up and bring their students through this exhibition. And additionally, um, we will train other students from other schools to be uh, facilitators as well. And the exhibition will also be open to the wider community. Our goal is to implement the four themes of the Anne Frank House, which you see there, uh, information on um, information and education on anti-Semitism, principle of equal rights, and prohib prohibition of discrimination, awareness of positive and negative aspects of identity and active citizenship. So to meet these goals, we're collaborating with Jewish Studies at the University, um, the South Carolina Dialogue Foundation, South Carolina Council for the Social Studies, and the South Carolina Council on the Holocaust. So we have several uh, activities <coughs> that we have planned, and I promise this is it. So um, by the opening of school next week, we will have a calendar of events ready for publication, and I hope I can count on uh, Ken Blackstone to help us get the word out to the community. Um, I've contacted you know, uh, the literary agent of um, Pat Conroy, South Carolina um, novelist, who has a connection with Anne Frank, and was, hey, would you like to come and talk a little bit? And the agent wants to know how much my budget is, which is slim to none. We're relying on in-kind uh, <laughs> donations. So I've sent her another email, laid out a plan, how much is it going to be, so I may be going around collecting cans and stuff to, to make that come through. Other activities that are in the works are a lecture on anti-Semitism uh, by Dr. Fred uh, Federica Clemente at uh, University, um, working on putting a panel of um, Holocaust survivor, children of Holocaust survivors to come in and talk about their experience growing up with parents um, who were Holocaust survivors. We're also involving the Palmetto Center for the Arts, uh, who will do a series of one-act plays and hopefully um, uh, tie it into, I mean, have a panel discussion on Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and also tie in the civil rights movement uh, 50 years on. Um, but I'd like to conclude with this. I think that all teachers, me included, uh, go into teaching because we think somehow we're going to change the world. And we get in there and sometimes get bounced around in the system. And so in this age of accountability and school report cards and school grades, um, I think it's very easy for us to lose focus of that uh, desire to change the world. I believe that this exhibition has great potential for reshaping communities, using Anne Frank and the Holocaust as a springboard to discuss modern day issues about um, sensitive topics that are still around in our communities, um, you know, has great potential. Racism, income inequality, scapegoating, xenophobia, you name it, it's all here within our state. Um, it might not be out on the front porch, wide open, but it's still out there um, and sometimes unfortunately drives um, public policy in some arenas. Uh, so perhaps together as a community, we can be as good as Anne Frank believed all people could be. So thank you and I'd like to, I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. I know that was longer than three minutes. Thank you, Dr. Vaughn. Uh, are there any questions? Open up for questions. How long were you there? I just wanted to. I, I, I was, you went pretty quick. I, oh, I'm sorry. I no, that's okay. You, that. I'm yeah. glad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I was in um, residency at the Anne Frank um, Foundation for two weeks. Okay, in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, okay. yes. Sir. Okay. That's so, where you. That's where your center of study was. You didn't go. You were totally focused on that uh, center. And the that was the main focus of of that. And then when I was planning my 
professional development. I thought, you know, I'm close to, to D-Day beaches, and so I wanted to go out there um, and see some things that um, I had seen when I went um, to France in high school 25 years ago. In Germany, um, I spent a few days uh, with former colleagues in Frankfurt, um, went out to Roman ruins. Um, so I saw a wide, you know, a thousand years worth of history, I guess, um, particularly with the uh, Bayou Tapestry. Um, that was, you know, you left there and you're like, wow, I just saw something that's nearly 2,000 years old. Um, so um, I learned a lot, and I think by traveling, it really helps um, me to be able to bring back personal stories to students and share that with them. Because uh, I'm seeing things that I uh, had only, always seen in, in history text since I was a little kid. What was your feeling when you went into that room that they stayed in? Uh, it was, um, it was, I guess, I don't know if surreal is, is the right word for it. It was the uh, one of the only museums that I've ever been in where it's complete silence. People, I mean, it's almost a, a, a reverence. And when I happened, the day that I was working in, in the group department, they had a group of American students. And so the teacher who works in that classroom um, left me there to, um, for a few minutes to make sure, she was making sure she had everything she needed. And she was like, oh, here's a copy of the diary in English. So I just happened to open it up um, to a section where she was talking about you know, forgiveness and, and realizing that the way that you behave may cause the way other, you know, reactions, uh, she was talking particularly about the relationship with her, her mother, and I thought, wow, you know, the, you know, got chills thinking about that, that that was, I looked out the window in the third floor there, that's where that was written. Um, and I think that, you know, at, at 15, she came to the realization that it takes people, I mean, some people don't come to that realization their whole lifetime, so, it was, you know, it's just hard to imagine being in that small space with people with very strong personalities and how can you be quiet all day long and, and not be able to see um, you know, or, or not give yourself away to neighbors who were just right out. I mean, in the back, there's the houses on the boat, on the block share a back courtyard. So, you know, how did people where I was sitting in that office not notice? There, there are people over there, but um, I was told, you know, people did not ask questions at that time. It was a very, very difficult time. Any other questions? Uh, will we get ahead of time the schedule? Yes, ma'am. That that will yeah. be on display from you said June August nineteenth through the twenty fifth. Yes, we're so. uh, we're doing like a a preview um, next week when they when Dent has its dash for success, uh, but we'll have a, a I'm hoping to have the firm calendar nailed down. As it evolved today, it looks like it may turn into a year long. Um, series of conversations um, long after the, the exhibition leaves, which I think is, is the goal of education. You want people to revisit things that they've learned in the past. And I think that's an excellent thing for the students to be able to, uh, to learn and see, because when I was in Berlin, uh, talking to the people who experienced the Holocaust just brought tears to your eyes. Some of the stories that the older people could tell tell you how they had to stay in hiding and the same thing you're just saying. So I would love to um, for the children to get that experience. So I hope they really take advantage of it. Well, and as I said, we really hope that the wider community will will come in because I mean there are a lot of people who have children who've gone through the schools here and now they no longer have a connection. So we really hope that they'll come back in and and see the things that we're doing. Um, I hope so, and I hope we do a lot of, of, of advertisement and take advantage of our R2 TV, encouraging people to come out and see. Because just the experience that I had was one of those I'll never forget. I mean, I can still see one of the, the ladies sitting in her chair telling us the story, and it just, it's very chilling. And I, I think the danger is these, you know, people there are not many survivors left, and you know the danger is that this story could be forgotten, and so um, it's a worthy story to, to continue to tell. And, and as I said, I think it dovetails really well with um, current issues. I mean, this is a story that's an easy entry. You can look at it and say, okay, well, this is an event that happened in the past, but then 
we we'll say, well, you know, there's some things in our not so distant past that we're not really proud of and we really need to, to bring closure to that. So hopefully, I mean, as I said, maybe I'm an optimist and um, think that, um, that this could really reshape community. So we'll, we'll see. I hope so because I have a chair that I purchased when I was in Berlin. And um, supposedly, now I don't know, but this is what the lady told me, that it was her family chair that somehow she was able to, to save and told me to never, I could get it up reupholstered, but never to have the wood, the wood uh, redone, leave it in its original shape, and all I do is polish it and, and leave it. So. There's an exhibit for you. But I do have that chair. Um, I wanted to comment that it's important for young children to read the diary of Anne Frank. Um, I know I was not aware of the Holocaust until I read that book. And then I asked my mother, and I said, is this true? Did this really happen? And she said it did. And that was my, she my sat introduction. sat me down and explained it to me. And I'm Jewish origin, so it was certainly very meaningful mm -hmm. to me. And I didn't know about it. So. Um, she was my entry point to the Holocaust when I was in eighth grade. And I, I emailed, well, I actually wrote a postcard to my eighth grade English teacher and said, never in a million years did I think when I was sitting in your classroom that one day I'd be sitting you know, in the rear garden of the, the Anne Frank house. Um, so. Um, we, we picked Dent, as I met at Richland Northeast, but it fits with the middle school curriculum. Um, and it's so important. It's important. In fact, we recommended it to one of the students we were disciplining, if you remember, I remember Chip. That. I do remember. And we not only wanted him to read it, but he wanted him to report back to us what did he learn. So it was very instructional. Yes. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. And I've got a little, I brought a catalog, they call it a catalog, it's based on the exhibition, but I didn't want to give it out in the beginning because you might be flipping through it like my students would, not paying attention to it. True teacher. True teacher. <laughs> there it is. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. certainly a, a moving presentation and I'm looking forward to the, um, the exhibit at DEMP. Okay, here's uh, item seven is our first uh, public participation period. Is there, was there anyone who signed up? No one signed up. Uh, it's open. We have a few minutes. Is, is there anyone who'd like to address the board at this time? I'll give you three minutes of talking to us. No hands showed, because so we'll go to the next item which is old business uh, action requested 8.1 approval of our revisions of policy be school board meetings and this is uh, dr washington would you read just refresh us on that right this is to uh, to amend the policy um, be uh, regarding time and place for board meetings to allow you the flexibility just a revision so first reading i mean it's up for approval tonight we can well, approve tonight, tonight. Mm -hmm. for approval. We'll move. So move to second. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Manning, any further discussion or questions about the policy? Hearing none, we'll ask the call for the vote. Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh, we're doing a little, a little um, trying to get things straight up here. Um, 
Thank you very much, 7-0 vote. Next item is the approval of request to amend our charter high school, the Charter High School, Richard II Charter High School. Uh, Dr. Ham, I'll let you start with that. You uh, have in your materials the section from the charter that, with the amendment that's requested. Uh, so in your packet, you have a letter of support from all of our current high school principals. And if there are any questions, we can answer them. I think uh, Mr. Love is here and he can. I have some questions. I've got some questions that I've been, I'm, I'm inquiring and I didn't get these thoughts or conversations until after we met the last board meeting. Right. And I was intending to send it to get the data that I need before the vote tonight, but I ran out of time. But I'm, I'm hearing from parents, and I just want to know how true this is. Num let me start with number one. How are children selected? Because I'm told that, that the children, particularly African American males, who are believed or perceived, I guess it's for lack of a better word, perceived to be problem children are recommended to the charter school. Can I get some feedback on that? Henry, would you come forward? And, and there may be some questions, so let's just come to the microphone, please. And I'll get closer to mine. Uh, I'm not sure where that information came from. We did not go out and look for any particular category of student. Uh, our doors are open to any student that wants to apply. We will not take any student that is up for expulsion or has been expelled. We cannot set our entry requirements any different from any other public high school in the state of South Carolina. Originally, the charter school had asked that all of our uh, students had passed HSAP and had PE. That was even struck down by the State Department. So we have the exact same entry requirements as any other high school. We had honors level students. We had students. Uh, with medical reasons, uh, we had one or two that uh, had had some discipline issues. We usually check with Cleve or someone like that to make sure that uh, all these students have been cleared from by Richardson II to attend. So I would say that our student population has no more of a discipline problem than any other high school. Is there any particular school that sends more students or more students come from any particular high school than the other ones? I would think we have a pretty good balance. I might have to go back and ask uh, Blythewood and Ridgeview might be a little heavier than the others. Blythewood and, and Ridgeview. And I'd say that maybe two or three more students from those two than the others. But and do you a, have an, an idea, just off the top of your head, what the makeup, the racial makeup is at that school? Uh, we had pulled it and we did an overlay of the demographics and it was almost exactly matching with the district. Because of the chairman, I did not hear you. <laughs> Just one second. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry, what did you say? We did an over demographic overlay on that, number of males, females, minorities, uh, everything. It's almost the exact matchup with the district. We're required by our charter not to vary more than 20%. And we didn't even close to that variation. It was like 20%. No, that's the maximum variation we can have, but the we maximum. have very, very okay. little. That's, I didn't hear that part. That, that's written into the charter, so. Okay. Your, your charter is set up to be, to represent the district, right? So. That's what I thought, but I'm just following up so that I can intelligently respond to what I hear from constituents. Any other questions for, uh, about the charter school or for Mr. Lovett? Again, you know, if we go back to the survey that we did, we had 100% satisfaction from our parents. I know you have a lot of medical issues, too, in your schools. So. But we, did, so we have um, several, especially of our female students, are anxiety-type things, attending you know, large 2,000 student high schools, things of that nature. And how long, say, if you get a student in, how long do you have any that just do not graduate or just drop out? Or do all of the students stay? In I, I wish I could say that they all do, but uh, like other high schools, we have some that drop out. We have, of course, this district being a very fairly transit district, we have students that move on. 
Uh, we don't find out they've gone until they're gone. Uh, you know, they don't come withdraw right up front or something like that, but we do the follow-up on them. Uh, we have a, several students that have come to our school, stay uh, their junior year, go back to the original high school to finish up. We have students that would not be able to graduate their senior year because they need extra courses. They can come with us, and if they work hard, they can pick up an additional course or two and graduate on time. Thank you. You answered my, my last question when you said they can go back and graduate from there original school. Um, that was yeah, we, we've school. been very pleased with our graduation rate looking at the students that we have. Uh, one of the things that we do that uh, you know you learn a lot by doing. One of the first things we learned is our students have to make a change to become a more active student. We're in a traditional high school. They sit in a classroom. They come over a passive student. They follow the instruction of the teacher, uh, the lesson plan and everything. When they come to us, they have to learn to get it on their own. Of course, we facilitate that and back them up and help them. But uh, I think it makes them a much stronger learner. We've had several that have gone into the Army. They come back to us and say they felt like they had a head start because they knew Blackboard back and forth and were able to you know, pick up immediately on what the military was doing. Several of us have said the same thing about going off to college. So uh, we, we've been pleased with the reaction from the parents and the students. Okay, and I had a parent that I guess I was referring to <coughs> charter school. And the question that I could not answer was the extracurricular activities. Do they have any extracurricular activities as sports or anything? Can they participate in anything like That's that? That's been about a million dollar question for the last three years. This has been battled back and forth the state legislature. And now they can attend or participate in extracurricular activities at their home school. In other words, the school they're normally zoned for. So if we have a student that wants to go play football at Ridgeview, but he's zoned for Spring Valley, he would have to go to Spring Valley to play. But they are open to ROTC and sports. And do they have a prom? That was the other question. We had, a prom, we had a prom our first year, the second and third year. The students have elected not to have a prom. Uh, matter of fact, the school even paid for everything on the prom when we had it. But uh, students seem to be changing as far as yearbooks and things that we always thought were almost sacred for high school. They are starting to overlook more and more of that. Okay, but, so can if say if a student wants to go to the prom, from their home school, is that permissible? No, ma'am. They have okay. they well, they can go if they have a date from that school. We get a request from that school to approve that student based on their behavior and academics and everything. But we have had some of our students attend proms at the other high schools. But they that's can't, only they with can't an invitation. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Only. Thank you. I couldn't answer those questions the other day, but now I can. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I don't have a question, if it's all right. I just have a comment. Um, is the uh, the liaison to the charter school, and I spend a, a good bit of time with the board and um, during the meetings, uh, I, I'm inclined to support the request for the charter school for ninth and 10th grade. Um, I think we've had an opportunity to talk with the school. I think they understand the, uh, um, the, the weighted task that this is because it is different for ninth and 10th grade students and is going to require extra attention and extra work. Um, however, uh, I do think it's the right um, step for the charter school to add ninth and 10th grade. Um, the board is, uh, is a whole and the charter school is fully behind it. And uh, because the board supports it, uh, I, I believe it's the right step for us to, uh, to approve it. And so I'll be supporting this uh, amendment in its entirety. And let me say this before we go forward. I am an advocate for the charter school. Uh, I think we have one of the best charter schools in the state. A lot of work went into it getting it set up right. We have a lot of support for the kids. I'm definitely not saying the charter school is a, kid, a school for most students. But there are students out there that have a special need or a special reason that they need to attend. So we don't want to go out and recruit ninth graders. I don't want to go in and say the charter school is a better school than Ridgeview or Spring Valley. If this student cannot be successful in a traditional high school student, I think we need to, have, you know, need to be able to offer them something where they can be successful. Mr. Chairman, yes. Uh, I, I support it as well, Henry. My concern is that uh, there may be a capacity issue with bringing both ninth and 10th grade on at the same time. And I, I've said that before, and I still remain concerned about that. I think because of what you just said, uh, the uniqueness of it, and, and particularly with ninth graders for whom this will be their first year of high school experience, uh, trying to make sure that they adapt and adjust well while bringing in 10th graders as well, both at the same time. Uh, the capacity to handle that 
given your staffing that you currently have, concerns me greatly. And so, although I am going to support because it is being recommended, I want you to know that I'm going on record saying I'm very concerned about the ability to handle uh, incoming freshmen and 10th graders uh, starting out new for the first time for your school. Question, uh, t are there any challenges that you have been experiencing with regards to um, faculty and staff um, no. retaining or, or turnovers? We hired a, uh, we had one, our English teacher left this year to go to Spring Valley. We have hired another English teacher uh, to come on board this week. Uh, all of the other staff, we've had no turnover at all in that. I still, still feel very confident in the ability of all of our staff to work with all of our students. Uh, our staff realizes that we're a small school, so each of us wear many different hats at different times of the day. Uh, so everyone is always willing to step in, do their part, and then some. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, let me just say that I do support the charter school. At this time, I will not be supporting ninth and 10th graders. Being a former high school teacher as well as a high school administrator, I don't think the charter school has what it needs to offer the transition of ninth graders and 10th graders that I truly believe, coming from a school setting and with my experience in the high schools, that they're going to fail. And I cannot go on record supporting that. We ask you to keep in mind these ninth and tenth graders if they don't come to us they're going to go to k-12 they're going to go to provost or somewhere like that and i think there's no comparison with our program and what they have to offer do you guys need oh i'm sorry mr jason were you finished before i ask you finish, mr. yes i am okay. thank you is there something we can make sure is in place to assist the ninth graders as they transition from eighth grade into the ninth grade in a charter school setting. Uh, is there additional staff that you might need to help these students to get adjusted in, in, in transitioning, um, uh, maybe counselors, or I'm not quite sure what the answer is, but is there anything that we can do to ensure that it's a smooth transition for the ninth graders. One of the good things about our school is you know, with the small number of students, we have a one guidance counselor that's there full time. So instead of one guidance counselor being responsible for 300 students, this guidance counselor will be um, available for a maximum of 120. Uh, I'm also there every day. We have evening classes for parents to come in if they want to meet with us or meet with a guidance counselor. Our parents do not have to take any time off from work to come meet with someone. Uh, and I think we have a lot of built-in support. Uh, Ann Holland is back here, works with them from day one on their career choices, uh, things of that nature. We have Jeannie Semino there for math. Uh, we have a plan as the numbers build up to add additional math tutors and science tutors. Will That's you keep us here. abreast? I, I would just like to know the transition period of how the ninth graders are transitioning. Yes, ma'am. And if there needs to be another guidance counselor. Well, from. Um, my first day in this district, I worked with at-risk kids through career prep uh, as an assistant administrator, as an assistant principal. Uh, I've always felt that was my calling to work with these people that have not quite meshed into the system. Uh, and that's where my love still is for these kids. Mr. Chair, I have one other question. I just, it really concerns me. And if you can answer this, what is going to be the accountability for these students? Because it's my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that they come in and they sign in and they can leave at any time. And I guess my concern with that is safety because parents are dropping these students off and we're talking about 14 and 15 year old students and they have the ability to leave at any time. So can you assure us what's going to be the safety accountability there for 14 and 15 year olds being dropped off, parents going to work and thinking they're staying there and they're leaving with their friends and coming in. So do you guys keep a sign in sheet? Just just kind of inform us of the accountability. Well, I can no more assure the safety of that student than I could one at Spring Valley or Ridgeview. But we do watch over them. We keep up with them. If we see they're coming in, as soon as the parents leave, they try to cut out, sign right back out. We're in immediate contact with parents. Uh, so we've had a good relationship on handling that. They can just sign out when they get ready? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So that's my fear with 14 and 15-year-olds connecting with their friends from neighboring schools. Well, Any other questions? I, I think, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that um, it, it is going to require a fine balance. The design of the charter school, 
part of that design is flexibility. Right. And there may be some of those students that flexibility is still part of what makes the program successful for them, but that needs to be closely monitored and work with the parents to determine whether that's appropriate for each child. And uh, um, Henry, I would assume that if there are parents who don't want their children to leave, that that would be something you would discuss and that those children would be there for whatever portion of the day the parents. We had one this last year that the mother wanted to know any time that child tried to leave and before she would get out of the front door, mom would know, we would tell them what kind of car she got in, the whole nine yards on that. But that has not been much of a problem. We had some students who wanted to come in, work for 30 minutes and go to McDonald's for lunch. We cut all of that out. Uh, we, I, I make no bones about it. I tell them from day one, they're there to get their education. We're going to all work together on it. If they don't want to be part of that, we need to look at another plan for them. But, but Henry, I do think that uh, Ms. Elkins does bring up a good point, and, and Mr. Jackson also touched on it. You know, ninth and tenth grade does bring different issues. I think you guys are aware of that. Um, and uh, I think um, maybe some sort of either near or, or midterm report on how that transition with ninth and tenth grade is going may be well received by the board um, to sort of back up whatever decision is made here tonight. You're requesting a semester report as well. Something like that? Yes. Like they don't have any problem with that. That's a semester report? Yeah, a semester report. A semester. You, got, you got grades, you got, you got is, that, is that how y'all work with semesters? Five? Well, we don't, we don't even have semesters. When our student can finish a course, in other words, they they, they, our, ours are on two at a time. As soon as they finish that course, they have a limited amount of time to get through with that course. If they finish it early, they are assigned another course to work through. Mr. Chairman, can we just allow the uh, district and the uh, charter school to work out what maybe sure. that reporting is and um, just take it out of our hands? Uh, but, but I would like some sort of interval report that we haven't had just because of the extra responsibility. for Maybe a quarter report or maybe a report if school starts in August. Give us an update how things are going, particularly for the ninth and tenth graders. I'm more concerned about the ninth graders. Uh, perhaps we can get a report around the 1st of November. That could, be an, end board, of that could be an board reason. Right, that's yeah. fine. Mm -hmm. That's okay. fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have a motion to... Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the amendment uh, as provided by the Richardson 2 Charter High School. M Mr. Chair, can I make a friendly amendment to that motion? Go ahead. Um, I need a second, though. Second. <laughs> now you can... I can do it. I just want to make sure that in our board packet um, that particular letter is taken out and replaced by the amendment by the revised copy with Dr. Ham. They just didn't have time to scan it. It was in our packet. Also in the document proposed to amend, um, I need to have in the third paragraph, it should read the high school principals and Dr. Ham and then the last sentence taken out. Brian? Yep, I accept that. Oh, yep, 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 yep. Okay. Good well, pitch. yeah, we'll, we'll clean that, the language up just a little bit and get the right people in the right spot, okay? Mr. Chairman, I hate to muddy the water anymore, but uh, um, would we be willing to also amend that motion to uh, include that the uh, permission or authorization for ninth to tenth graders to be only for one year until the board has an assessment of how it has worked before we make it a permanent uh, decision. I, I would support that. I would support that. Okay. Thank you. That's the motion. Yes, this sir. is a one year uh, agreement. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other motions, amendments? That's, they're all been dealt with. Hearing none, we are ready to vote on the proposal uh, amendment <coughs> to the Charter High School. Very much. It passed uh, six six one. Thank, thank, you. thank you for your continued support on the school. Uh, again, I think it just the district is doing a great job of putting another option out there for our students to try. To do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, next item, new business, no action requested. Okay, uh, state assessment scores and um, ES, EA accountability results. Uh, Dr. Ham. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to do a lead-in to this report, which will be made by Mr. Potts and the subsequent report that will be made by Mrs. Millette. But even before our test scores came in, uh, we began looking at a variety of data, previous achievement test scores, we looked at survey results, we looked at focus groups, even those that were conducted by the board, we looked at classroom observation data, we looked at demographics, and we began talking about what we needed to do as a system to begin to improve academic achievement. Because improvements happen sort of at the system level, at the department level, at the school, at the classroom, and at the student level. So we started by looking at the student level. Um, based on that, we formulated four priority areas that I already shared with you at a previous meeting. Those. Uh, but the first of those areas, and probably the most important one, was learning. Um, knowing that change and improvement happen at the system level, we started to look at things in the system that we should change. So one of them is to make sure we have this clarity of purpose that we communicate regularly and throughout the district. So people know those four areas, they're talking about those four areas, and we clearly communicated that. The second one is to try to do some organizational change to align with the goals of improving student achievement. And in that area, I want to thank the board for approving the reorganization of academics. Because we did that, we're able to provide a real focus on elementary, middle, and high school, more customized, consistent, and thorough support than we've ever been able to provide before. So I want to thank the board for that. Uh, we also created a very strategic kitchen cabinet. And just to give you a couple of examples of the strategy, we've expanded our executive staff to a kitchen cabinet that includes people that cover those areas that we think are critical to improving student achievement. So for example, Abby Cobb, our lead social worker, is there because we know that students are impacted by poverty, they're impacted by transients, and the work of those helping professionals is essential to their success. Jeff Pot has been, Potts has been added to that group because we have to look at the data on a regular basis if we want to make improvement. We've expanded our key leaders to include a variety of people throughout the district so that we can make sure that the message is communicated to everybody who comes into contact with our students and our teachers. And instead of having a district design team, we actually will have district design teams focused on using the information that we have to improve achievement and other areas that impact student learning that have been identified as priority areas by the key leaders among the district. So we want to make sure that we eliminate impediments of learning and that we have a system that's really aligned to um, improving student achievement. Um, as a learning organization, our focus is everybody in the district is learning how to continuously improve the success of our students, that our job is to get better constantly. And then finally, we worked with academics and we've developed a logic model that's up here. And I'm not going to go into the details of that. That may be something that we want to revisit. But we, need, we know we need to continuously improve our profession and revamp what we're doing with professional learning to support the achievement of all of our students, that we need to have leadership and support and we're beefing that up across the district. And finally, this issue of continuous quality improvement, to consistently be looking at data and looking how we can use a whole variety of information to continuously improve what we do. So with that sort of a backdrop, the report you're going to hear tonight from Mr. Potts is additional information that we want to share with you and that Sue Millette and her team as well as people in other departments have used to sort of take what was the system focus and start narrow it down into some other areas where we know we need to take action. So with that, um, this is the first, it will be a first of series of reports that Mrs. Millette will be making, but with that I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Potts. Thank you, Dr. Ham, Mr. Chair. Members of the board, uh, tonight I'm going to share with you uh, information about the recently released uh, data in terms of past results, HSAP results, 
and then the new ESEA accountability waiver. Uh, first piece I want to talk about is in regards to pass. And I'm going to try to get a lot of information to you in a really condensed form. Um, but the first slide that we have up here on the board shows the gaps that exist, uh, the two-year gaps that exist from 2012 pass to 2013 pass. And positive numbers show an improvement in terms of percentage points, percent of student scoring met or higher. Um, the items in red or the, the green items are values that increased by more than two percentage points and the items in red are the values that decreased by more than two percentage points. Um, if you notice uh, a highlight for this year, uh, grade three for the district went up uh, by pretty large value in all grades um, and we did have some areas of notice uh, specifically in mathematics in middle school. Those were things that I think we've noticed in previous years. Uh, the gaps that exist in two years. I also wanted to show you um, the difference between um, the Richland two scores and the state in terms, once again, percent of students scoring met or higher on pass. Uh, if you see um, elementary school, those gaps are all pretty good, uh, but when we start looking in middle school, specifically in the area of math, once again we notice that uh, we, we're falling short in terms of uh, what we're doing for students in middle school math. Um, we can see those gaps. Obviously, we'd like to see more green than red. Um, and I think we're seeing more green than red than we did last year. Um, so uh, hopefully, we're turning things around. I want to also share with you information about HSAP. Um, HSAP is an exam uh, that students are required to pass in order to graduate. and. Um, Students have to uh, pass the ELA and the math portion of the exam. And uh, in 2013, uh, we had one of the highest percentages we had, I think, in the last four or five years in terms of percent of students um, passing both exams, ELA and math. I received a lot of questions uh, from people within the community and, and some of our administrators within the district about uh, the new ESEA rating. Uh, you may remember uh, last year that Dr. Ham and I, as well as uh, Debbie Elmore from the School Boards Association, came in and presented uh, a lot of information, not just on the ESEA rating, but on um, all of the ESEA waiver. A scenario that I'd like uh, for all of us to look at, uh, students in your class are set to take the final exam. Which scenario would you prefer? 75% of the students pass the final exam and the average grade on the final exam is a 90, or scenario two, 90% of the students pass the final exam, and the average grade on the final exam is a 75. These two scenarios bring up uh, an issue that exists in terms of us, us valuing what is more important, and that is an average score for students within a class or a percent of students passing. And for the last uh, 12, 12 or so years, under No Child Left Behind, we've been living in the system where we value percent of students scoring met or higher, percent of students scoring proficient. And the new ESEA rating looks at what we value in a very different way. It looks at the average performance of students, uh, not just in a class, but throughout the school and within subgroups. So instead of looking at percent of students scoring met or higher, we're looking at percent of students, the average score that students score uh, within uh, a school. You may remember this, uh, this stair-step climb chart. And this was under AYP. Uh, back in the year 2001-2002, less than 20% of the students were expected to score proficient or higher um, on the state assessment. And every three years, that percentage would go up by 20%, 20 percentage points. Somewhere around the year 2007-2008, we started to have some outcry, and I think schools realized that uh, if we continue down this road, by the time we get to 2013-14, when the expectation is all students will score pro proficient or higher, I think people realized that that wasn't going to happen. That maybe that was a great goal, but maybe that was a too lofty of a goal. Um, we still have a system that is similar to this, uh, where we don't go up uh, by a per certain percentage point every three years, we go up by a scale score value every year. I don't want to hit all the highlights of some of the technical differences between AYP and the ESEA rating, um, but as we said, instead of uh, looking at students scoring pr proficient, 
we're looking at an average performance or a mean scale score performance across uh, the school. A big difference is the sub subgroup sizes um, in under AYP were as large as 40. Uh, the minimum subgroup size is now 30, except for the graduation rate, which is only 10. Now, under AYP was all or nothing. If you remember, if a school missed one of those subgroup pieces uh, for ELA or math, they would miss AYP altogether and they were a not met school. Uh, under the ESEA rating, there is an opportunity for schools to score partial credit. Um, now, instead of that met or not met value, schools are, are going to get a letter grade, something between an A through an F. A major difference is subgroups uh, that exist. The ESEA rating added male and female. Um, I do want everybody to understand that under um, both systems, um, the system looked at subgroups that um, were, uh, I guess, lower performing subgroups. Uh, free and reduced lunch. There is not a paid lunch subgroup that equates with that. Students, uh, LEP students, that doesn't measure non or, or English proficient students as a subgroup. Um, students that are disabled are another subgroup that's looked at. Students that are not disabled are not a subgroup that compare. So in many cases what happens, you can have a student who may be disabled, a student who is uh, limited English proficient, um, a student who's on free and reduced lunch, that student can be counted in all those subgroups, also, also will be counted as an ethnic group, a gender, and in the all subgroup. So what happens in both of these systems is there are groups of students that get counted a lot more times than other students. And sometimes I think um, it's, there's an unbalance of the types of students that end up getting weighted. One last uh, note, there is an addition of science and social studies for, EL, for elementary and middle, and also for high school. As I said before, the rating uh, continues to grow every year. The target gets larger. For elementary schools, uh, this year the target that they have to reach in every subject is 635. That scale score value goes up five points every year. By the time we get to the year 2017-18, in some grade levels, a value of 660 scale score is an exemplary score. That means the average student within a school would be expected to be exemplary on pass. That's if we get that far, obviously. Um, the same thing is true for high school. Um, instead of looking at percent of students that, that, um, that pass HSAP, we're looking at an average scale score for students on HSAP, and it increases every year as well. I want to show you an example of what it looks like to actually calculate one of these for a school. I'm going to use Killian Elementary School. As I noted earlier on the chart, the scale score that, um, that all elementary schools need to earn this year is 635, and that would be to earn full credit. So no, that doesn't work. under the all subgroup under ELA 2013, you're going to see a 650.6. Since the all subgroup is higher than 635, they earn one full point for that subgroup. Same thing with male directly below that. 646.7 is higher than 635, it earns one point. I want to go down to the disabled subgroup, which is 605.8. That did not meet the 635 value, but is larger than the value from the previous year, larger than the scale score from the previous year. And so they can earn partial credit. Even though they didn't meet the 635, they can earn partial credit by increasing from the previous year. So the way they earn partial credit is you take the difference between the two years, which is about 1.6, and you essentially round it, um, or divide it by 10 and round it. So it's approximately 0.2 points earned for the disabled subgroup. If you look over in math, um, you're going to see that all those values are red. The all subgroup, 631.9 is red. It didn't meet the objective, 635, and it dropped slightly from the previous year. Same thing with male, female, African American, disabled, and subsidized meals. All of those didn't meet the objective, but I want you to look at what happened in 2012. In 2012, the objective wasn't 635, it was 630. That means uh, Killian Elementary earned 
was higher than 630 in most of those subgroups except for disabled. So they earned full credit in 2012 for almost all those subgroups. If you look at the difference between the two years in each subgroup, it's a pretty minimal difference um, uh, in terms of their math objective. You add up the total number of points divided by the number of objectives. We could do the same thing for science and social studies uh, based upon their point system. And I'm going to move ahead to this. This chart is kind of the summary chart that shows you the number of points and objectives for each one of those uh, tests. You'll notice on the right hand side percent tested in ELA and math. Um, and since it's state law that we have to have, you know, more than 95% of the students actually test, or all students test, most of the schools earn full credit for this. Um, but if you look in the area of ELA, um, Killian earned 30.3 of 35 points, earned zero in the area of math, and the key thing I want you to look at is the weight in, for ELA and math. ELA is weighted 35% and math is weighted 35%. Those two together are 70% of the points that, that Killian would have earned. You add the total number of points together, and it's on a, eight, a 90, 80, 70, 60 scale. Killian Elementary isn't going to be an F this year, or has earned, earned the F's grade this year. They were a B last year. Uh, they were a B school. The reason I use Killian is that um, this goes back to the initial question about what do you value more? scale score average or do you uh, or the percent scoring proficient if you look at uh, what Killian did in, in 2011 12 to 2012 13 in terms of the percent of students scoring met or higher they had an almost nine point increase in the percent, uh, percentage points of students scoring met or higher in ELA and almost three points higher in the area of math so one of the difficult things that I think schools are around the state are having with this system is they can show growth in terms of the percent of students scoring met or higher, yet it doesn't equate to what happens in the ESCA rating. Um, we have lots of schools around the state that are having major fluctuations in scores. And some of the reason behind is some of the growth that I've seen, I've heard schools go from F to A, and I won't go through Blythewood um, High School's full example, but if you look at the graduation rate in terms of Blythewood High School, the Hispanic Disabled and Free and Reduced Lunch um, uh, subgroups are the ones that didn't earn points for the graduation rate. Some of the schools around the state that are moving from F's to A's are actually seeing some of their subgroups go away. Because if you have less than 30 students in a subgroup, it doesn't count for the school. So um, while we would love to say that that is growth, in many cases it is not actual growth. Well, that was a lot of information. <laughs> Before we move to uh, Ms. Millette with the academic piece, do you have any questions about any of the information that I presented here? Uh, that was a lot of information. Thank you, Mr. Potts. Um, but, but it was understandable, and I think you did uh, explain it as well as it could be explained. Uh, is there questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, uh, Jeb, I, I appreciate um, what you've offered tonight, and certainly I have no intention of shooting a messenger, uh, but, but let me say real candidly, uh, I think when you're presenting it in terms of, first, when you're presenting it in terms of percentages, uh, it's a completely different picture than when you're presenting it in terms of raw numbers or the numbers of students affected. And so, though the numbers may say 1.2%, 3.4%, when you start multiple, when you start factoring it out in terms of the, the number of actual, actual kids, who have scored below average and who are performing poorly, particularly in math, uh, it's very alarming. And I would hope that we would show both next time mm -hmm. and so that we have a realistic picture of what we're looking at and not just percentages. The other issue is I, I think that when you're looking at a comparison of, uh, of how we are doing in awards we just gave out a little earlier for closing the achievement gap and we look at those same, those same, those same subgroups and how they're performing on our on our assessment instruments, it's a mixed message, and I think we need to clear that message up. Mm -hmm. Though I think we're working really, really well, but I think we need to make sure that everyone is real clear on what what those Pell Medal Gold and Silver Awards for closing the achievement gap really mean in the context of, of this accountability. And I know Mr. Chairman probably not asking a question, I apologize, but I just wanted to share that. And then the other thing is with the 
ESA uh, uh, letter grade rating that they're giving, which is completely different than the State Department letter grade they're giving, we really are going to confuse the public in terms of what grade is matters most and what do they mean when they're not the same themselves. And so I think we need to offer some explanation of, of what's happening, uh, happening there uh, as well. And then the final point I make is I think what you talked about tonight is simply a precursor to what we're going to be expecting to see uh, two years from now when Common Core assessment kicks in and not only in Richmond 2 but across the entire nation student performance in particular areas, particular areas like the ones you've talked about tonight will, will be uh, even more difficult to explain. So I think the, the more we start making it clear of uh, the challenges we have now in terms of percentages and raw numbers, uh, the easier it's going to be for us to begin to honestly and objectively discuss the problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Apologize. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Uh, Chairman. No. Yes. Additional comments. Uh, you know, I think we, we said as a board, too, one of our challenges is, you know, if I'm a parent moving into Colum the Columbia area, and I know Killian's a great school, they're doing a great job out there, but as a parent, I look at Killian as a potential place to move, and I see an F, and I look at maybe a Lexington one or, you know, another district, and I see an A. Um, it doesn't matter to me all the gobbledygook that went into the background, right? I mean, it's the end of the day. And, and also, um, and so that's one of our challenges, and I think that's what, you know, one of the, the issues that uh, Mr. Jackson pointed right. out is how do we communicate sort of what that is and how do we may allow parents to make uh, informed decisions with all the different data that's out there. Um, but, but also, you know, you presented the uh, issue, would we rather have, you know, less students make a higher grade or would we rather have more students make a lower grade? Um, to me, that's a, a very fundamental problem in that, you know, if I have more students pass, but they all pass with the 75, am I happy with that? Um, it depends. Did they get the foundational skills to move on? And does that 75 begin to erode a little bit each year? Um, because they didn't quite get all the foundational skills that they needed um, to get to that next level and have mastery. And it also depends on the perspective. Um, am I okay as a parent if my child is the one that's in that 75% range with the score? Um, I would say no. Um, am I okay if my child is in the 90% range? I would say yes. Um, so again, the, that's a foundational issue that we have to make sure that we're all aware of and working towards the same goals um, because I do think that 75 can erode, you know, that one skill that they didn't get or two skills that they didn't master when those are key building blocks for the next thing that they need to do, does that begin to erode the scores over time? And uh, so I just, I don't want to let that key piece kind of slide by. Um, because as, as Mr. Jackson said, the percentages, you lose the individual children in that. And what that means is we build on top of a, you know, slightly weaker foundation. Um, you want your foundation to, to pass across the board 75% or do you want it to be 90% and fix the area that we need to address? I don't know. So, thank you. Questions, good comments, Ms. Johnson? Yes, I have one question. I'm not sure who can answer this for me, but I want to know, are the schools inviting parents to come in so they can explain the grades and what it means like you explained it to the board? Do we have something in place for that? I know that uh, I've spoken to a number of principals who are doing a lot of work to bring in and, and already have uh, brought in you know, SICs and PTOs and have had me come speak uh, to parents at their school in regards to what this means and how do you how do you explain this? How do you explain the other state rating, as Mr. Jackson mentioned? How do you explain uh, Palmetto Silver and Palmetto Gold? And I think for a lot of them, they realize that they have to let their they have to let their school and community really define what kind of school they are, and not wait until a rating system comes and defines what kind of school they are. So I've been I've spoken with uh, a number of uh, principals, and I've and, and I've been out to to help kind of address how to make sense of some of this. Right, but the scores just came out, so you wouldn't have spoken with those parents. Well, we, we did it last year when the 2012 scores came out. Um, okay. So after that is when we started addressing these things with, with the parents in the community, yes. Thank you. Other questions? I'm ready for the next part of this. Thank you, Mr. Pott. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, you, you own uh, Dr. Ham, who's next? I think I know. Mrs. Millette is next. 
Thank you, Dr. Ham. <clears throat> um, as Dr. Ham said, we have really taken a long, hard look at our systemic organization, and it takes many people, many hands, many minds to work collaboratively together to, to make it successful. So in your board packet, you have a focus for our improvement, a chart with um, ten items uh, written across, or eight, eight items written across that we felt like were very, very important. So I'm not going to read that to you, but I have created a very simple or I should say quick uh, slide presentation and I'll touch on some of those things that are listed in there. Um, our common core standards and instruction is number one. Learning, as Dr. Ham said, is key. It has always been key, but we have, we're ramping it up. Um, K-5 alignment documents, um, our folks worked very hard this summer uh, with teachers in ELA and math to create those documents. It's uh, still in progress. Um, we are in the midst of working on a common core curriculum uh, standards website for not only our parents, but also for our teachers to have one place where all the information is located so that parents have uh, easy access to it, and so do our teachers. Um, our implementation teams met twice this summer uh, with our consultant, as well as with our um, folks in academics, and they are well underway. We'll be working with them um, throughout the year. As, as a matter of fact, next week we have our consultant, Judy Carr, who will be with us um, next Monday and Tuesday. In K-12 mathematics, we know that math is a concern, a big concern, and sp specifically with the new um, math standards coming out. Um, we are taking a look at offering courses, content courses, and I will say that in, in middle school, many of our teachers um, were grandfathered into middle school. They were elementary certified, but could be grandfathered in, and in some cases they did take some additional content courses. But we're going to beef that up and give a more teachers an opportunity to really go deeper and, and understand their mathematics uh, content area as it relates to our Common Core. We're also going to look at the vertical alignment and course offerings that we have in math, K-12. We feel like that's something that needs to be uh, looked into carefully, examined. What is it that we're actually doing? Um, are we on the right path? Are we really meeting the needs of the students? Um, so that's those two areas. The next one, we have middle school, and you notice that's one whole area. We know for a long time, even since my being in the district for a number of years, middle school has been a real concern. And we have put together a really fine three different teams for elementary, middle, and high. And so we are laser focused on the middle school curriculum. But as we look at our test data, as we look at our course offerings, we realize that our honors and ELA math courses need to be re-examined for rigor. We need to make sure that we are, in fact, providing the rigor, not more stuff, but more substantial understanding, giving students opportunities to really delve in and understand mathematics. And we're also going to look at the middle school schedule, um, maybe going back to what we used to do with teaming, where you had four or five folks who worked with a group of students uh, throughout the year. So we're looking at those kinds of things. Uh, we know that poverty and transiency is a huge um, area of concern, but it is what it is, and we are really working very closely with everyone, uh, including our wraparound services through special services, our nurses, our um, social workers, um, Dr. Vickery and her staff. Um, we're looking at the socioeconomic data. We're looking at everything. How many times a student is uh, sent to the nurse? How many times a student is absent? We're going to take it down to the student level so that we really know who those students are who really truly are at risk and as well as those who really need to be bumped up with our uh, rigor in our um, uh, honors courses. And we're continuing a partnership with um, Francis Marion for their Center of Excellence in uh, teaching uh, children of poverty. And we're excited about that. We'll offer a series of seminars, not only for our teachers, but also for our parents. So uh, Nancy Gregory is working with Francis Marion to, to make that happen. Next, leadership development. Um, that covers or crosses several of our areas. Um, the one that uh, Dr. Ham alluded to is our reorganization. And let me again personally and uh, publicly thank you 
for your really uh, endorsing and accepting and um, allowing us to reorganize. We have not reorganized in 13, 14 years. We have not added new folks in that length of time, and yet we've put on or brought on at over seven schools, more magnets, that kind of thing. So having a, a, a elementary team, having a middle school team, and having a high school team really will help us, as Dr. Ham said, really focus on those areas and pro provide the uh, support that they need. Um, We've been uh, talking to our principals, and Dr. Washington is going to reinstate her aspiring uh, school leadership seminar series that she did uh, several years ago. And our new principals, our, some of our veteran principals, have taken it upon themselves, along with Dr. Washington, to provide a new principal academy. And this is led by our veteran principals working with our um, brand new principals. So we're excited about that. Uh, new teachers, we have 136 brand new teachers, I think a little over 250 teachers new to Richland too as well. Uh, we have been able to uh, add additional um, support for that. We're excited that we have now a middle school math and middle school uh, science um, coach who will work with not only middle school but with high school. That's Nancy Ankney, and Mary Lostetter, as you know, will be our uh, math. Um, Nancy will be our science. We also have had the opportunity to hire a full-time special ed teacher to work just with our special ed teachers. We know that we lose them after, sometimes just after the first year, and now we have someone who really can work very closely with, with those teachers, and we're excited. I think Julie Shaheen is, is uh, that person, and we're delighted. We were able to offer a six-day new to two that included two days that the teachers could spend with their principals at their home school, getting to know their um, protocol and their procedures and have lunch with the principal and a leadership team. But also they worked with our instructional coaches on a variety of topics, and we felt like it was very, very successful. In addition to that, we are offering seminars uh, throughout the year for our new teachers, and that's been redesigned based on their needs as well. And we know data is very, very important. We're delighted that we are now more inclusive, I believe, because we're working closely with uh, Jeff Potts in our academic um, arena uh, to look at not only um, the data that we already have, but the data that's going to come in, excuse me, um, in the, in the near future. But we're looking at not only the test data, but the soft data. And, and we think that's very, very important. Again, digging down to those students. Um, professional learning for assessment, we know that that is one area that is very difficult for our teachers. How do they, how do you know your, your students are successful? How do you know how to uh, write an assessment, a, f a formal, informal assessment to measure their growth. So we're bringing in a consultant, national consultant, Kay Burke, working with our uh, teams of teachers, elementary, middle, and high. So we're excited about that opportunity. And then instructional technology is a critical part of what we do. Uh, you know, we're in year three of one-to-one, -one, and uh, they will continue our ITS school level as well as our district level ITS folks are working closely with academics to ensure that we are integrating fully uh, all of the things, the tools and the strategies that we need to help students be successful, particularly when they take the Smarter Balance test online. So we're, we're excited about having that partnership as well deepened. Okay, I think. And then um, support, Dr. Ham alluded to customized support. Well, we're looking at our priority schools. We know that's one thing that the board is very concerned about. So we are going to provide customized support. We're going to offer professional learning based on their needs. It's not one size fits all, but it's based on what those students and those teachers need in their schools. We're going to uh, monitor the instructional programs at these schools, uh, what are, what's working, what's not working, and eliminate those that are not successful and not working uh, to help our teachers and principals out. We have school level data teams, meetings with academics and with Jeff Potts with the schools. We'll continue doing that this year. And then um, we're going to increase the collaboration between our alert, ESOL, and our um, 
uh, special education teachers with our regular classroom teachers. We think that is part of the problem is that uh, coordination, that collaboration, those regular ed teachers understanding how the students, ESOL students learn and how our special ed students learn and, and really challenging our alert children as well. And the final um, action, uh, academics action plan, and this was not in your packet, um, but just to give you sort of a brief overview of what we're really going to focus on, this is just some of the highlights. It's not the complete detailed report, but basically we're going to be looking at um, each school's leadership teams to review their data, continue with that. We're looking at patterns. We're looking at trends. Um, I can't read that far away. <laughs> um, we're also going to discuss their needs and resources. What do they need from us? What kind of resources do they need to, to assist them? Uh, we're going to develop and implement, implement a school action plan based on their strategic plan. Uh, we think that's important that we work with um, planning office and Will Anderson to make sure that we are following their strategic plan and making it so that it is more user friendly, if you will, and more adaptable to what those students and those teachers need. Um, we, I know that you've asked uh, several times about walkthroughs and classroom observations. We feel very strongly that we need to collaborate together and come up with a sort of consistent format that we use so that we know what we're looking for. I think sometimes we think we know what we're looking for, but do we really? So we're working together uh, with the f uh, elementary and middle and high school folks to, to re, re, uh, create those. Uh, we're also going to conduct daily classroom um, observations and with the high priority schools and provide specific feedback. What is it that those students and those teachers actually need? And then another thing that we're going to do uh, is to administer the um, MAP uh, program with Common Core Aligned Test in ELA and Math for all students in grades 2 through 9. And that's something that we have not done before. So that will give us some um, information that we, we feel like would be very helpful. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, a lot of information. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now, just just to see, tell tell me what your plans are for the next couple of um, presentations. What are you going? Well, how, where are we going from here? I mean, Dr. Ham and I have talked about that, and we I'll let Dr. Ham address that if you want to. I think maybe a good place to start would be with middle school and some of the plans for using data. It's clearly a high priority area and I think that would be a good place to start. Well, I think Mr. Manning made a point about the 75%. When you get to middle school, you hit the wall. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happening to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you mm -hmm. would, anybody can analyze that. You don't have to be an educator, really. You just look at the figure, something's happening there. And I think that's one of the problems we're mm -hmm. facing. So uh, our, our challenges are great. I, and again, um, even though it, I'm going to quit there. Uh, Mr. Manning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to um, thank you guys. It was obviously well thought out. A lot of time and effort went into um, more than just a presentation. That's just <laughs> giving us the work that you're going to do for the year. Um, and it, it's exciting to see this level of detail and how much work you guys have put in it uh, into this. Um, very excited about the classroom walkthroughs. Um, that's been a big um, topic of mine for a number of different areas. and. Uh, so I'm excited, and I, and I think that will really help our, our teachers, too, to know that that's kind of consistent no matter where they are or what they're doing and help our students. Um, another big area um, of mine, and I'm sure I'm not going to um, ask you to, to elaborate on today, but as we go forward, um, again, going back to the 75% idea, remediation for our students. Mm -hmm. Some schools have test retake policies. Some look different than others, and I, I don't know that it needs to be the same across the board. But, um, but, but that is one of those types of things that I think leads to mastery. Mm -hmm. And so um, as we get sort of the uh, evolution of this report, I would like to know um, what, what are some of the plans for remediation? You know, are we using some of our uh, grant money or, or how are we doing that, um, offering those extra opportunities for students to get mastery, which solves a lot of our key issues. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Becker? have two comments. Um, great report. But I guess my, I don't know, maybe I just have a personal problem with this. Okay. 
everything you've listed on this as a focus of areas for improving achievement, what have we been doing in the last few years? To me, this is common knowledge that we should have been doing a long time ago. Well, to answer your question, it really is, has taken us an opportunity to really look closely at what our system is all about and to review that. And I think Debbie, Dr. Ham has been really instrumental in doing this and putting some of these things that kind of were maybe seemed like they were on the back burner to the forefront. And so um, we are moving ahead. So. Well, I believe we're moving ahead, and I commend Dr. Ham for taking it and going forward. But my problem is how many students have we neglected because we didn't take it to the next level a long time ago? That's very difficult, I think, for, for us to say at this point. But um, I can assure you, our folks, our teachers, and our administrators have been working diligently. Um, and, and in many ways, we thought maybe they were, we were all working together. But what we're finding is that we need to do more collaboration. We started doing that. We're going to continue to, to collaborate, not only with um, the elementary folks, but the, to articulate from elementary, middle to high school. And I think we now have a, a platform, if you will, that we can go to, something that's a visual, something that's a focus, that y you all can see and our principals and teachers can see where we are and where we're going. I want to add just a little bit. I, we have had <coughs> excellent school, school teachers. I mean, we are blessed with wonderful teachers, and I think our students have had great opportunities to learn. I hope two things are going to happen this year. One is that the focus that we have will let us step up those efforts in two ways. One, by focusing on things that are really important. And the second thing I've said, it needs to be sort of like um, a way of taking off the plate some things that we may have done for a long time that really aren't contributing to student success. So we're focusing and putting more into certain things and maybe removing some things that we don't need to be doing. And the second thing is I already feel, working with the people in the schools, tremendous energy. People are excited about the school year. They're already doing wonderful things, bringing their teachers back to school. And when a positive attitude is contagious. And I think the affect of our teachers are and our leaders will make a huge difference in the affect and the ultimate success of our students. Ms. Dr. Chia, yeah, I, I can agree with the excitement. That I agree with the excitement being back in the district, and I commend you for that. Um, I just don't want to be sitting here next year or even the next year and hear, oh, well, we didn't collaborate enough. I really want that to be a strong focus that all the departments are speak, talking to each other. Because, I mean, Jeff's been around. Sue, you've been around. You know, why haven't there been the communication? So, in other words, we, we failed our students. Well, I would like to echo what Dr. Ham said. We have a wonderful group of teachers who work very hard, very diligently. And in just a minute or two, you're going to hear from our teachers who participated in summer staff development, and they didn't get paid. They did it on their own time. So we have folks who are really anxious, who really are willing to step up, who have stepped up. We now have, I think, a, like I said, sort of a framework in which we can operate that's visible to everybody and not just one isolated group or another. Thank and you. I'd like to add one more comment. Any teachers sitting out here within the district, I am not attacking you because I know how quick those tweets and everything else go off. <laughs> and the rumors get out quicker than I can get out the door. That's not where I'm going with this. It's just we lost the communication somewhere in the last few years, and I'm glad to see it starting to come back together. Um, Mr. Chair, can I just add one thing? And I, I truly agree with Dr. Ham. We have excellent teachers in the district. They come in early. They stay late. And I'm looking at Rita Rayleigh, who's one of those great teachers. And I think 
providing that walkthrough and giving immediate feedback back to the teachers, I think they're going to get even better because you can't do what you don't know you're not doing. So teachers, I applaud you. You're doing a great job, and you truly have my support. I've been there, so I understand. Okay. Can we, uh, Mr. Chair, real quickly, that last slide, who was controlling that, the slides? We need copies I think Ms. Joe that Barker. last slide where you said that they would be someone would be monitoring the classrooms. Who's going to be monitoring? Okay. It didn't specify no. who was going to monitor. I think you might be referring to the where we where we are conducting uh, classroom observations Correct. with high priority schools. Yes. Who's going to be doing that? Well, uh, when I say we, uh, my, our academics team, along with principals and other teachers. So it's going to be a, a collaborative group of folks. And we know that teachers do want feedback. They want really specific feedback, and we want to provide that for them. And it's not an evaluation. It's not that. No, I understand. It's I to, just wanted to know who was doing it's it. It's to help our team and academics uh, along with our uh, school level folks. Okay, and let me ask one other question mm -hmm. for the new teachers because I noticed that we have so many, our turnover with our teachers, and I've discussed this with Mr. Garrick before, and I'm trying to, to close that gap on why we have so many teachers, particularly one to three years, I think was the number of years they were staying and leaving. And I'm wondering if there is something we can set put in place. Um, and I'm not going to say how often, but perhaps once a month or every other week, those new teachers who seem, are not even just new teachers, but any teacher that seem to need um, some help that they've identified that they need, we need to put something in place so that they can feel comfortable coming and saying, we need this, this is what I need. I don't feel that I'm getting it, and they don't feel that they're going to be a backlash from doing that. And I don't know what that needs to be that needs to be put in place, but have you guys thought about doing something like that so that these people can can feel comfortable and stay in uh, the education arena versus a couple of years and they're gone? Because we invest a lot of money in hiring these teachers and then they stay one to three years and they're gone. And I know the things that they, the reasons they put on there uh, that we see in our board brief are not all true reasons because nobody wants to burn a bridge that they may have to come back across. So I want us to be, and I'm not gonna say more friendly because I'm not saying that we're not friendly, but I think there's another component that we're missing. And perhaps some of the teachers or new teachers or somebody can, can come up with that and figure out what that component is and we can offer to these teachers so that we can retain them. Retention, you know, we, we get these people, they seem really excited and then all of a sudden something happens and they go. Well, I would just like to say that um, before the economic downturn, we had instructional coaches for every content area in addition to the elementary folks. We did not have a, one who was just specifically for special ed. And so now we're able to bring back these, these instructional coaches. I think that will be, uh, I, I'm hoping you'll see a big difference in that. I'm saying something um, besides the instructional coaches because sometimes, you know, there may be personalities with the coaches. So if you have a group of people who can come together and discuss openly their concerns and not just one instructional coach, coach is working with this set of group of people because personalities make a difference in how well people open up and how well we can actually communicate. So I'm just wondering if there's something, that's something I'd like to ask you guys to, to look into, uh, perhaps get a team of people to come up with some dialogue on how we can make this effective, particularly for re retention. Mr. Chair, 
Chairman, if I could make a comment, I'd like to follow up on Ms. Anderson's comment. Um, I spent the, several days this past, well, early this week and the end of last week with sort of an open door with letting anybody at the district office drop in for 15 minutes to talk to me about issues that were on their mind. And I heard people from several departments raise exactly the same concern you had about in terms of providing adequate support for these new teachers. We have a, a lot of people who are in their first year, but we know we lose teachers those first three years, as you said. So. Um, we clearly do need to put together a team and think about how we can beef up their support and make sure that they get, that they feel like they can get any kind of help that they need. And I think um, one of the nice things coming into this position is that a lot of people have said, I'm eager to help, tell me what I need to do, I'm on board, and I'm thinking we're gonna take up some volunteers. <laughs> well, great, great. I'm glad I'm not out on left field with my thoughts. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I would hope that in the future um, that we would streamline the agenda when we got topics of this importance so we can have more time to discuss it. I feel very rushed right now. I got a list of questions. I don't want to tie up the time to go through them and have the conversation, but I really think this is critically important as we go forward and the next time you plan the agenda, if this is going to be on there, let's eliminate as many things as we can so we can have more time to talk about this critical issue of improving student performance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, and we are going to have more time. Thank you. Have more more sessions like this. And um, I've been here doing this a long time, like Ms. Anderson. And, and there's one thing I've, there's always been true in this district, in any job or any organization I've been in. It's all about leadership from the superintendent to the schoolhouse. I'm seeing all these principals. You're good leaders. You got good ideas. And if you don't, and if you, you let me know if you don't feel free to do your ideas. But, I mean, I don't think that's the issue. We've got to make sure we've got great leadership in positions. And I think when we do that, a lot of the stuff you're talking about will be done and, uh, and we'll get we'll move it forward. Now, and we are going to discuss this again. We're going to, this topic will be, we're not drop. this won't be the last time. I want you to look at the vert vertical alignment of curriculum. I have been, doing, I've been talking about that for, as long as I've been on this board. There's no reason why a kid doing math can't just go to wherever he goes to. I mean, I know we can't offer calculus to a sixth grader, or why not? But I'm just saying, but whatever that, we, if we can't offer that, then that parent has a, will have a question about our, what we do here. Or whatever that, whatever that is, I don't know what it is. We got to line this thing a little bit better, and, and, and I think I have my math, math scores. We're going to have to move on because it's, we're, we're running over almost two hours. Now. I want uh, Ms. Gregory. I'm going to. I'm not going <laughs> to squeeze you, but I'm just want to keep you. Okay, on task and on. Uh, can I ask first? How many people do you have speaking tonight? Um, I have three groups, and they're going to be three minutes each, so they're very short. Okay. Um, good evening. Let me ask you this. Yes, ma'am. Are they going to be presenting the same thing we read in our book? Um, are they they gonna... are going to. We have somebody that's presenting from the Project Based Learning Institute. Uh, one group is sharing about assessment, and the third group about the alignment documents. Okay, and just... we can, I can cut it as, as short as you would like. Well, they are here, so we need to hear them. Go ahead. Okay. Right. Right. Um, we can. We have a short video montage that's two minutes, okay. um, and uh, we're going to start with that to just show you what happened this summer. I'm going to reference the documents in your package. You already have those, and then the teachers will come, and they each have three minute presentations. So uh, we'll spend most of the time with the teachers sharing. But thank you for the opportunity to share our summer professional learning. And so Shelley, you'll start us.
professional learning that you saw was with support staff, administrators, and teachers. Um, what I wanted to reference real quickly in your board packet, uh, you have in your packet four pages of professional learning. So, I, of course, I'm not going to read that to you. Um, you received this in June where we outlined everything for you, so you have descriptions of all the sessions. I did want to highlight our summer institutes that we held on June 25th and 20, through 27th, July 9th through 11th. We had over 114 sessions for administrators, teachers, support staff, and over 1,600 participants. And I did a graph for you, or you have a graph in your packet that actually shows you the break out of that participation. And as we said, we were going to focus on Common Core. I wanted you to see what the breakout was on Common Core uh, with a large percentage of the sessions on Common Core, math textbook training, and so on, which you can see in your packet. And the um, other category, I wanted you to know um, that included things like CPR, crisis management, those kinds of things. So I did want to point that out to you. Um, very quickly, I want to move on and actually let the teachers speak. And we have several groups of teachers that are going to do very short presentations to give you snapshots of what they learned. Uh, our first group is from Killian Elementary. And I have Courtney Rector and Emmy Powell who attended an assessment workshop on July 9th and 10th um, from formative to summative, learning all about assessment. Good evening. Good evening. I promise to keep it very short. <clears throat> um, we attended the Kay Burke presentation training, and it was phenomenal. Thank you so much for allowing her to come and share her wealth of knowledge on assessment. Her focus was formative assessment. Um, she, I'm, I have a list of pros for formative assessment, but I'll, I'll move on to um, performance tests. Specifically, we have an example of one for first grade. We both teach first grade. Um, performance tests are mostly focused more on criteria, criterion-based rubrics. Um, this requires higher, higher level thinking, which we know is so important with the new Common Core standards. Um, it's more of a process rather than just a product. Um, it reaches a greater variety of students, and it gives them choice in um, their learning. So Ms. Powell is going to show. Um, very quickly, I'm going to kind of give you an idea of the process that the teachers went through each um, during this time. And you really want to engage your students. Therefore, in the beginning of a performance task, you want to get a catchy title, a catchy um, questionnaire for them so that they're really brought into it. You always, performance tasks are done towards the end once the students, you have taught them everything. And this lets you know where maybe did I go wrong, maybe where do I need to get back and focus on a little bit more. But it doesn't, it's not a paper pencil thing. It's that kids aren't at that point anymore. So um, we basically, we did a fairy tale mix up where the students had to identify character setting and sequence of events. And um, they went from there. We've got a very quick, catchy title. Students are given the, um, their, um, sorry, they're given their task. And from there, they are given a variety of ways to show what they have learned based on that task. Um, in kinder, or first grade, we also have workstations that reinforce what we've been teaching throughout this, um, this time. And then after that, this also helps reinforce this. And students are then allowed to show what they've learned. In this one, for example, we did a questionnaire. They're writing a drawing of a poster or an actual interview process where they talk to us about it and share with us based on questions we have for them. And then we take from what we've learned from these performance tasks that they've given us, and we reevaluate where the students are, who do we need to do a little bit more DI for, and then also if we've done what we need to do and can we move on. So that's kind of a nutshell example of a performance task. Any questions? And how is that different than the way you've been, you would have been doing it last year? Um, for me, it's not different, but mm -hmm. for other teachers, it may be a longer process and it may require more hands-on work for a teacher. 
Um, it does take a lot of thinking. This was just three days worth, and it was not completed in the three days, and we went from 8.30 to 3.30. Um, but the good thing is with the rubric and the checklist that students will get, once, you, once teachers have created it, they can apply it to other performance tasks, but also it makes the kids responsible. So, and the parents and the teacher. And using those rubrics as they go along, they're allowed. You can see, okay, let me stop this kid before it gets way out of hand and they're totally confused. Thank you. Thank you. So if you were struggling with the creation of a rubric, who would you contact to help? Um, a variety. Um, we did this as a group. Usually um, at Killian, we do it as grade level. So it's not just one or two people. It's a group of people. If I did have problems, curriculum coordinator Ms. Nancy Diggs with us. Um, if not, other teachers at other schools would be an all, another opportunity. And then administrators, anybody that can assist with us. I'm not the best at making them. I'll admit that. So any help would be <laughs> wonderful. So. You have the time to reach out to people. Yes, sir. Um, we did this in advance. This is actually, we're going to use this one. And um, we communicate it with people, um, for example, mistakes on exactly what we wanted with it and how we could tweak it to best meet it. It also is a process. We may realize, oh, we shouldn't have put this in for this one. And when we reuse it again, we can say, let's tweak it. Students also. Students sometimes come up with great ideas teachers ourselves don't always think about. So, anything else? What are you assessing here? Um, in this particular? I mean, what, yeah, what are you assessing? We, in this particular one, could the students identify their character of a chosen fairy tale? Our standard is identifying a character setting and sequence of events. Okay. In this particular one, they have to identify the character um, of their chosen fairy tale. For example, Red, Little Red Riding Hood. So comprehension of what they've, okay, that's all. Yeah, sorry. I I mean, <laughs> sorry, yeah. I mean, I, understand. I, I could read all the words. I just couldn't understand <laughs> what you were trying to get the kids to do. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any questions? Thank you. All right, thank you. Emmy and Courtney. So what they worked on, um, they unpacked standards, um, they worked on performance tasks with the matching checklist or the congruent checklist and rubrics for the rigor, which was great preparation for Smarter Balanced. Our next group is from the Center for Knowledge. We have Lisa Leitner, Melissa Hawkins, Sally Dunbar, and they're going to share what they learned in the Project-Based Learning Institute in July. I'm Melissa Hawkins, and um, Jolene um, encouraged us in May to start thinking about project-based learning and to learn about that, and she offered us four opportunities. And so we were very grateful to the district for having this wonderful workshop in July for us to attend, and the three of us worked together. Um, I teach second grade, and they teach first grade, and so we came up with a project together, um, and we had to really... Um, you know, we had to really look at what we could do together because we wanted to collaborate with our grade levels at both schools. And so um, we came up with the importance of pollinators and looking at life cycles and habitats, and that was something that we could work on together since those are um, standards that we teach. But, um, you know, it was very, the great thing about this, um, when we went for the first time to tell us what project-based learning was, the presenter started talking about immigration. And that's one of the big units that we do in second grade with our Hirsch curriculum. And as I listened to her talk, I thought, we do that. I, my children did that all year, all during the unit. And I was just so impressed that this was something that we were already doing. We laugh and say Jolene is such a visionary, and she is. And so um, we felt very comfortable sitting down and doing this together. The great thing that we learned was we learned so much from our pe all the people that we were working with, middle school and, and, and all the different elementary schools and getting feedback, and we just thought it was a wonderful example to start something a little bit different. The, the focus was totally different than what we did with our tier work, but it was similar and it, was, it was, had some similarities, which was great. That's my minute. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Leitner, and I've been in the district for a very long time. 31 years. And I have always been a first grade teacher who has really known my state standards and my common core standards. Now I'm moving to CFK. And I've got to also learn the, common, the um, core knowledge. So when Dr. Hall called and said, I'd like for you to take this opportunity to go to the PL um, conference, I said, great. 
not only did it give me the opportunity as a teacher, a veteran teacher, to go and work with my peers who I, I had not had the opportunity to do, but I also got to see the meshing of the Common Core and the Core Standards. So that, that gave me two days of working with these two great teachers. I could take what I knew, incorporate what they knew, we meshed it together and came up with an activity, with a project that will go across the grade levels and I feel very confident and I'm very pleased that I had a part in it and I'm not even there yet. I don't even have my children yet. So collaboration, and I've heard this throughout the whole night, but collaboration was so important and I just appreciate that opportunity that I had after 31 years to come learn something new and come out excited and I can't wait till school starts because of it. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Sally Dunbar, and between the three of us, we figured we had a hundred years of experience. Between us. <laughs> We've been around a while. Um, Ms. Spector mentioned collaboration, and that's what we had an opportunity to do, but that's also what we're going to expect our students to do, and to collaborate multiple tasks across the standards, um, even down as low as kindergarten and second through second grade, we do that at Center for Knowledge, and I'm sure that across the district we're going to be seeing a lot more hands-on. It gives a child a um, chance to research and utilize technology and other resources to develop a product that um, is going to prepare our students for the 21st century workforce, because as business and industries have projects and products that they they do, they're not in isolation. So they're bouncing ideas across each other with, a, with an end result in mind to answer our essential question, which for this was how do pollinators impact um, the habitats and life cycles. So it's as simple as kindergartners, as through high school we were able to see a lot of high school projects and it was a, an experience that we're excited about taking back. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Great job, ladies. Thank you. And our last group, um, I want to introduce Alice Sean. Alice Sean is our elementary literacy coach, and she worked with a team of second grade te well, actually, she worked with teams of teachers this summer on Common Core alignment documents, and she's going to talk to you about that work. We are very excited to talk to you about this tonight. I'm going to be very brief, but this was in the plan that Carol Sample and I spoke with you about in May that um, as far as our common core alignment, our professional development for our teachers to ensure that they are ready and that they're going to get their kids ready with the common core standards. So in May, we, um, Carol Sample and I, my partner, who you've met before, but you'll hear from her in just a minute, um, we worked really hard to ensure that these teams of teachers, we had teams on every grade level, and their teams from across the district. We, we really looked at the four corners of the district to make sure that we had diversity on our teams from experience to the school populations they served. And these teams worked two days in May. Um, we were very appreciative that we could provide substitutes to take these teachers out of the classrooms for two days. They have worked all summer without pay. We gave them chocolate and water. That's what they've had, okay? So, and they're still working. You have a copy of the second grade alignment document for ELA, and I believe you have a copy of the math. They are still in draft form, and I'm going to be very honest with you, they'll probably be in draft form all year, because as we present these to more teachers on August the 16th, on Friday, we're going to tell the teachers they will be online for them. We're not providing paper copies because we want their input, and these are working documents. So as an, a great mini lesson comes about, we want to add it. If there's a great resource, we want to add it. But I have the group of teachers, and since they've been here since seven, I just want them to stand for a minute, and then I have two second grade teachers that I'd like just to share their experience very quickly, okay? So the second grade teachers for the ELA group, um, Raquel Jones from Killian, and Mary Matt Fuller from North Springs, I knew it, it's just late, 
Rita Raley from Pontiac, and then I'm going to ask Renee McRae from Catawba to speak with you, and Shelly Mann from Lonnie B. Nelson. Liz Baggett was here from Sand Lapper, but she's a mama, and her little girl starts school tomorrow, so we sent her home at 8.30. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. My name is Renee McRae, and um, we had a great, great experience working on the ELA alignment <laughs> document. Um, the team consisted of teachers across the district, um, teachers that had a few years of experience and teachers that had 20 plus years experience. Um, as a team, we felt like it was important to include um, the best practices that veteran teachers bring to the table as well as the new ideas that beginning teachers bring. And we had such a good time working together from the time that we were pulled out of our classrooms in May to come together. It was like we had already known each other. We had a great um, working relationship. We collaborated well. We had set our agenda. We split off into teams and we really got the, um, we got the alignment document written. Um, we continued to work this summer like Alice said and um, created something that we're really, really proud of. We feel like it'll be something that all the second grade teachers are, across the district will use and therefore there will be some consistency throughout. Um, as Alice said, it is a draft form. We created the framework for it and we feel like it's a really good framework, um, but as the year goes on, teachers across the district will input and add resources as time goes on. My name is Shelly Mann and I teach at uh, second grade at Lonnie B. Nelson. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the document itself. Um, we started with the standards, the Common Core standards, and that really drove everything else that we did. Um, we put in benchmark assessments throughout each section of the document. We incorporated technology with our Chromebooks that we have and our iPads and websites. Um, there's a lot of choice in the document. So if a teacher has a really great text that she wants to use and it's not listed, um, there's plenty of opportunity for that. There's um, weeks added on for project-based learning that we've kind of collaborated on and asked other teachers to share ideas with. Um, and I think that this is going to give us that consistency. I'm really excited about it. I had a great time working um, with my new friends that I didn't know before on it. Um, and I, I'm just excited because in one of our professional developments, we had a first year teacher. And um, if I would have something like this when I started, it would have been much, much easier. Um, I wouldn't have felt the way that I felt my first year in this district. And it, it's like that, you know, we have done these documents up to fifth grade. Um, so I'm excited about it, and I think it's wonderful, and it's going to help us as we grow and, and move forward in the district for all of our assessments and everything. So thank you for the opportunity. Any questions? Thank you, Shelley and Renee. Um, just very quickly, I'd like to have the second grade team say, stay in the math team because you have their document. They're not going to present, but I'd like to recognize them because they did stay and they are here tonight. Uh, first, the math coach, which is Carol Sample, and uh, we'll ask any of the members of her team to stand that are still here. Terry Stone from Round Top, Miranda Perkins from Condor, Linda Phipps from Catawba Trail, Megan Burton from Windsor, Christina Harris from Bridge Creek, Maggie Inman from Bookman, and Cindy Heron from Nelson. Thank you, ladies. <coughs> for your time tonight because we really wanted you to see their enthusiasm. We chose these three activities because we felt like they really tied in to our implementation of Common Core and these folks are to be applauded for their commitment to their own professional growth during the summer. So we are really grateful for the wonderful teachers that we have. And what I want to close with just very quickly is the team leaders have something for you. On August the 16th, we will be having district in service. Uh, we would love to invite you to come join us and they are going to pass out session guides for you so you can see what kind of activities we planned for our teachers on August the 16th. They have them. Oh, yeah. passed them out. I didn't realize you already had them. So anyway, <laughs> please join us. We're glad that you have those. And do you have any questions for me? Versus for One quick question. How many um, 
teachers, did you say, participated, um, worked without pay? Um, everybody on that list that you have for summer <laughs> professional learning, correct, Ms. Millett? That's correct. That long list that you have, four pages long. So they are, have, they are very committed. Thank you. Thank you. And we appreciate your continued support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great report. <coughs> and now we're going to our agenda items for our next board meeting, which will be at Sand Lapper. The uh, first item on the list is a student learning report. We'll have a report um, on professional development activities, and this time with more perspective on students the 2013-14 back to school report, a report on the use of choice options, and a proposed policy revision to policy BD, which is the organization of the school board. Future uh, items for the, uh, for, our, for our board meetings, anything that you want to present now? Okay, hearing none. Our, this is our second time of public participation. Is there anyone who would like to address the board at this time? Raise your hand and come forward. Yes, sir. I want you to state your, just state your name. Uh, you know, generally, my name is Wayne Evans, and I don't know if this is the appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, to address the board in reference to one of the items coming up for voting. I'll if it's about student appeal transfer request, um, Mr. Evans. Second. Okay. I just want to address the board and I, I know all of the uh, items have been presented to you all is my understanding for your review in reference to the student transfer request and I would just uh, again like to let you know that I, you know I'm here if you have questions for me or of me um, I take it very seriously the request and I just wish that the uh, I think with the special circumstances surrounding this particular request um, that uh, I would like you to look inside yourselves for when it's time to take that vote. I thank you for your time. Thank you. I know you, now I remember you, Mr. Evans. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, board Superintendent comments. I'm going to start. Um, Ms. Anderson? Uh, I just want to say that I appreciate all the reports we received tonight. I'm just thrilled uh, with the enthusiasm that the teachers are displaying. I think this is a new day in District 2 that was long coming, and I'm just really proud that um, they all seem so excited and happy. And I just want to thank everybody, and <laughs> Bob, before you go, find some money to help out these folks that work for no money. <laughs> Do the magic wand and come up with something. We'll see what we can do, Mr. All right. That's why I want to know how many of it was because I think it's it, it shows that we need to show our appreciation. And um, I think all this staff development was held within the district. And I know you did have some people to come in, but it's a lot cheaper than uh, staff development has been in the past. So I just appreciate not only those teachers who spoke, but I appreciate everyone in the district and for all of your hard work coming together, supporting Dr. Ham, and let's make District 2 the district that we know that we can be. Thank you. And I did not, I was looking for something that Barbara asked me for, but on the agenda item for next time, and it doesn't have to be the next board meeting, but whenever, I'd like to add uh, Karen Cooper Haver. She went to London and represented District 2 uh, with her own expenses um, on intervention in the district, and she got some great information and really made District 2 shine. But we could have her to do a brief synopsis of what she learned in London for that name. Hi. I made a note of it. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Spectre? I just want to echo what um, Melinda said as well. Uh, the reports were great tonight. And um, the enthusiasm throughout the district, I've heard nothing but positive feedback. Everybody seems to be so happy, ready, geared, and ready to go. 
Um, I just want to wish everybody a great start for the new year. We're here if you need us. And okay, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Miley. Welcome. Um, certainly wish you the very best as you uh, come on board working with our, uh, our tremendous district and uh, and the efforts that have been and the efforts that have been put in place by Mr. Davis over the many many years to keep us at an exemplary level. And I'm certain that you will do no less than that. So welcome, welcome to you there. I also want to welcome back um, all the principals and teachers who were here tonight and certainly uh, look forward to the opportunity to meet and greet the new principals that are coming into, into their roles for the first time and, and what they are going to be faced with in terms of challenges. I, I agree with Ms. Sanderson, the reports were outstanding. Um, I think that that's one step. I think the next step is making sure that we take a serious look at soft and hard data as we make determinations and decisions regarding uh, what things are going to be implemented and what things, as Dr. Hammond said, are going to be put to the side to ensure that the academic success of all students. Thank you, Mr. Potts, for the report. As I said, I certainly was not going to shoot the messenger, but I, in order for us to have a very serious conversation, an in-depth conversation, a realistic conversation, we really need to look at it in its totality. Uh, I think percentages are wonderful, but I, and percentages have changed from the year before are wonderful also. But if you don't know what the, change, what the numbers were last year, the percentage of change this year didn't really, I think, uh, work in terms of making sure that we're talking about how many kids are being affected, how many third graders, how many sixth graders this year did not pass, pass, and, and, met, and came below the average, uh, and, and then begin to address the issues uh, that, that are associated with that raw number uh, so that we know uh, the total sum of what we're, what we're dealing with. But I certainly want to thank you, Dr. Ham, for your willingness and your, your courage to uh, hit these issues head on. I appreciate that very, very much. I have a tremendous amount of respect for, uh, for you, as you know, and the work that you have already committed to doing. And I certainly want to uh, publicly continue to support you in, in, in those efforts. Uh, last comment I would make, and that is that I certainly want us to continue to uh, remember our students as they come back to school this year because the challenges that they've faced uh, uh, during the summer can adversely affect their uh, readjustment and reacclimation back in, back into our schools. And so I certainly hope that teachers and principals and parents and administrators will all um, come together to make sure that all of those issues that um, uh, impede progress and success are addressed. I think the whole idea, the notion behind um, project-based learning is a good one, but in my opinion is predicated on a, a foundational level uh, that's not necessarily true for all of our students. And I think that everyone in here uh, who, who looks at the data knows that that's true. There are so many of our students, for whatever reasons, and certainly um, and there are multiple reasons, uh, that they are not at that foundational level that will enable them to be successful. And so ratcheting up the, the, the ante for them uh, is a challenge that we need to make sure that we are providing the fundamental skills and building blocks that will enable them to uh, be successful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Ms. Brown. Um, it's hard to follow, Mr. Jackson. I um, appreciated your comments. Um, it's a great meeting, a lot of wonderful information, and I appreciate everyone's enthusiasm. Um, appreciate Mr. Potts explaining all the data. Um, Mrs. Millette, with your detailed presentation, it was excellent. And certainly Nancy Gregory and the teachers, it was fabulous and much appreciated by me. Um, con congratulations to Dr. Molly. Um, I remember you when I was on county council and your presentations were awesome and made a big difference in a lot of our decisions. So I'm sure you will continue to do the same. Welcome aboard. Um, congratulations to the schools, Palmetto Gold and Silver. Um, I know you've worked hard for that recognition and we're certainly well aware of the effort that it takes, and we're certainly very, very proud. Um, you make us all proud. Um, and I want to thank Dr. Vaughn, social studies teacher from Richland Northeast. I thought his experience and his presentation was outstanding, and it just shows you how much there is that we need to learn and we need to know about the world that we live in, and um, I hope all middle school children will have an opportunity to have the exposure to the information which he presented. So it's an exciting new year. I'm excited and um, look forward to supporting you and helping you in any way that we can. Thank you. Elvis Johnson. 
first I want to thank the teachers who presented today and especially want to thank you for giving up your free time because we know you do that all the time so we really appreciate that and then second on Sunday August 11th I was a sponsor along with the McEachin um, Foundation and Richland One where we hosted a high school pep rally for Don't Text and Drive. And just want to say thank you to those parents that came out from Richland District 2 and the students. We had almost 500 attendees there and over 200 students signed the pledge that they will not text and drive. So I'm so excited about that. And I look forward to sponsoring that again next year. Um, the next thing, I'd like to wish all faculty, staff, and students a blessed and super school year. Mr. Chairman, I want to uh, echo all of my fellow board members' comments. And Dr. Miley, we'll see you uh, next year. Remember, you asked for it. So <laughs> that's what my <laughs> wife reminds me of all the time. Uh, but welcome aboard. We look forward to having you. Uh, certainly all the teachers, and I want to remember also our support staff um, as we go into the year. It takes just a whole lot of people to make this thing work, and uh, parents and everybody else. Um, Henry and, uh, and, and Audrey with the uh, charter school. Um, that it's been something you guys have been looking forward to for a couple years now and we finally made it happen with ninth and tenth grade and um, so this is the, the time to shine and, uh, and and move forward in a good direction there um, also I want to um, put in a, a little plug I met with one of our teachers today um, Jonathan Mayshat works out at Spring Valley High School uh, Jonathan has uh, authored a book called Aliaga and uh, actually um, Walmart it, he's in a contest right now uh, potentially Walmart will pick his book up and put it on the shelf and uh, so I uh, appreciate Jonathan's good work and uh, a, a book about character and about uh, healthy lifestyles he actually made the name Aliaga up and gave it a meaning of health of body and mind and uh, so um, j just another sign of the amazing talent that we have in this district um, and he's uh, certainly relaying the skills that he has uh, personally to the, the students out at Spring Valley in the digital arts program. Um, Dr. Ham, um, I think the one word that's come back to me over and over again is the word joy that you talked about and that four squares that you brought to us. And uh, I just cannot say how many times that has been echoed back to me um, and other colleagues that, uh, um, that there is joy. And, and I think that that is just translated into this excitement um, I don't think we've had this much clapping unless there's some kind of angry mob uh, usually in the crowd um, and excitement for positive things going on in the district. So thank you for your uh, efforts and uh, looking forward to a great school year. Dr. Ham. Well, the hour is late, so oh, and a lot has already been said. I'm going to be short and sweet here. I do want to express my best wishes to everyone for an incredible school year. Our teachers never really left, but our students are coming back on the 21st. It's going to be great to see our students and teachers together in those classrooms and our halls and schools busy with the excitement of learning. So I wish everybody well, and it is going to be an awesome school year. That's great. Um, very short. Uh, Dr. Miley, welcome aboard. We're, we're, I'm excited to have you here. I know your wealth of knowledge will, um, will just fit hand in glove with Mr. Davis's tenure here for 16 years. And we're going to really miss you, too. Uh, I can, <laughs> you've been here with me the whole time, and it's been That's great right. um, to have your knowledge. Um, uh, also, uh, Dr. Vaughn, I just I don't know if he's here or not, but uh, what a great presentation. History is something that has always been an interest of mine because we forget it so soon, so easy, don't we? We can't remember. We can't feel it, so we don't remember it. Can we? So, and he'll, he's going to help his students remember some things, and I, I feel proud of him for that. Um, and some support staff. Jack, I want this to be the third straight year that I haven't gotten a call on the first day about bad bus situation. <laughs> it's been three years since I've had a call, and I, let's, let's make it four, okay? <laughs> so I'm looking forward to school start. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you about the time I got a call at 6 o'clock in the morning, but uh, we'll do that later. Um, but uh, it's a lot of excitement going on. Let's keep it up. we got a whole year. we got these kids that we've got to teach, and they'll, and they'll respond. They'll respond. Okay, do we hear a motion to go into executive session? Second it. 
Uh, <laughs> we got to read the motion. Yes, yes. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move that we. Oh, boy. Hold on, sir. Let me get you here. Barbara had me tied up. I okay. move that we go into uh, a recess public session and convene into executive session for the purpose of a discussion of student expulsion, student appeals, student readmission requests, student admission requests into the district's adult education program, ratification of personnel, personnel matters, legal matters, and contractual matters. Is there a second? Or is, or, or is anybody leaving? Everybody leaving? Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Well, hang Let's on. Let's vote. <laughs> oh, I got it. Okay, vote on your... supposed to stay up. No, I thought it was supposed to stay up. You have to vote for Ms. Anderson. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>